Um, and we're actually going to skip a bunch in terms of um, reading the text today and watch a, um, a, flu, a few, <coughs> few clips, some of them somewhat long. Um, and if I remember correctly, we left, correct me if I'm wrong, at 1, 2, <coughs> did we get through Act 1, Scene 2? One three. We stopped, we stopped off at three. Okay. Um, okay. Pick up <clears throat> on uh, page eight thirty seven. The Archbishop of York, who's called Scroop, is meeting with Mowbray, Hastings, and Bardolf. And we find out, the bottom of page 837, left-hand column, Hastings says that they've got 25,000 men. Okay? But he goes on and says, <coughs> I'll just read that passage. Our present musters <coughs> grow upon the file to 5 and 20,000 men of choice. That is, these are good men. These are, these are not, you know, the kind of troops Falstaff um, presses into battle. And our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an insensate fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and 20,000 may hold up head without Northumberland. Okay? Hastings said, we've got 25,000 men, but we can only supply them if Northumberland comes. In other words, Northum Northumberland is, is, is essentially going to bring the supply train, the supply lines. And so Bardolf wants to know, can we survive without Northumberland? Hastings. Notice how Hastings replies. With him we may. Put that in a negative. Without him, we can't. Bardolph, yay, Mary, there's the point. What's Bardolph getting at? They don't have the numbers without Northumberland. And what happened to the previous attempt at rebellion? Without Northumberland. It fell apart. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is... We should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. What does that mean, by the hand? It's right there, arm right hand. Presently there. So put all that into modern language. What's he saying? We have a modern adage. It goes back a long time. Two in the hand is worth... One in the hand is worth two in the bush, whatever. Okay. What's he mean? What's, what does that adage mean? Uh, what you have is more valuable than what you might have. Better to take what you have than maybe what you might get. Okay. So Bardolph is saying, um, let's not stick our necks out too far. Until we are sure, meaning until Northumberland's here with us. For in a theme so bloody as this, an intent is what that means. Conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids in certain should not be admitted. We cannot launch, he is saying, unless we have surety. Assurance, insurance, if you want. Okay? We can't do it on the basis of conjecture, expectation, and surmise. The Archbishop, tis very true, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. In other words, Hotspur launched knowing 
his father wasn't coming, knowing Glendower wasn't coming. Bardolph, it was my lord, who lined himself with hope. What's it better to line yourself with? Actual arms and armor or hope? <laughs> I won't get political, I promise. Okay. Eating the air. How do you eat air? How, um, how filling is air to eat? On promise of supply. Flattering himself with a project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. Okay. And so with great imagination, proper to madmen. Now it's fairly shortly after Shakespeare writes Henry the Fourth, Part Two, that he writes a Midsummer Night's Dream. In other words, this play precedes Midsummer Night's Dream. But notice what is in his mind already. Imagination proper to madmen, like in Theseus's speech about imagination. And lovers, madmen, and poets, okay? So with great imagination proper to madmen, led his powers to death, and winking, leapt into destruction. What does that mean, winking? Closing his eyes. But is it really closing your eyes? What is a wink? It's brief. Okay? That's what uh, Bardolph means. He closed his eyes, but for a moment, and gone. Okay? By your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. In other words, Hastings is saying, you know, but you still have to plan on the possibilities that there might be more aid, etc. And so then Bardolph takes that and launches into this kind of long speech about, yeah, you're right. You never construct a building without first, what? Making plans, coming up with drawings, talking with contractors, okay? But he says, going on, picking up with uh, line 55, or else, we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men. He's suggesting to get a marker, which there's one there. Let's say, you know, we have Hastings here, Bardolph here. Mowbray here. Okay. Hastings is, Hastings is suggesting, yes, but then we can have Northumberland's men here and here. Okay. Bardolph is attempting to say, yes, but here we have real men and real men and real men. And here we have only the names of men. What's it better to do? To go into a battle this strong or actually this strong? Is it better to launch a war, you know, um, with all of your troops or to send in 50,000 first and tell them you're going to bring in 100,000 later? Do you want to be in the 50,000? Okay. So he says... We fortify in paper and in figures using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it. Who, half through, gives o'er and leaves his part created cost, a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. Because if you plan for so much and you only have enough to build this much, and this is what you build. 
How is it when you get this far? Unfinished, incomplete. Is it useful? No. <laughs> There's no roof. Better to plan this much, build it all, enclose it, have it nice, warm, cozy, and dry. Okay. Hastings, grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth. In other words, he still is positive. That is not positive, meaning 100% sure. He's positive. He's looking forward to the hopes being fulfilled. He says, well, okay, grant that they should be stillborn. And that we now possess the utmost man of expectation. That all we have now is the utmost we can expect. I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What's the flaw in that logic? So did Hotspur. And look what happened to him. What? Is the king but five and twenty thousand? Is that all he has to? To us, no more. Now, that can be interpreted a variety of ways. That could be his way of saying, well, no, he's actually got a few more than that. But compared to us, doesn't matter. Nay, not so much. For his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. What he's actually saying is, no, he doesn't have 25,000. Why? Because he hasn't directed all of his force against us. He's directed a third against the French and one against Glendower. So only a third of what he has is going to fight us. So is the unfirm king in three divided. Unfirm how? Okay, he is sick. And Bardolph, uh, excuse me, Hastings, I think, does mean that. He's not well. How else is he unfirm? His forces are scattered. Exactly. His forces are divided, which makes him less firm. All right. So the archbishop, hmm, that he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not be dreaded. We don't have to worry about him uniting his armies. Hastings, because if he does, what does he do? He leaves the other two flanks open for the French to attack or for the Welsh to attack. Okay. So Bardolph says, who's going to lead his forces? Hastings, the Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland. Okay, now keep in mind, historically, how old is Hal? 19, pretty close. He's 19. Okay. How old is the Duke of Lancaster? At least a year or two younger. So when they hear the Duke of Lancaster is coming, do they go, <gasps> and quaver in their you know, boots, proverbially? Mm, not quiet. Westmoreland, however, is an older man and has been through wars. Him? Yeah, they fear. The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth, that is the king and the prince of Wales. Against the French? I don't know. So the archbishop, let us on. That is, let's advance. Publish the occasion of our arms. That is, as we move forward, let every town and village know why we are in rebellion. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. He thinks, as we move forward, what's going to happen? Yeah, the rebellion will swell. They will get more and more soldiers flocking to their cause. Okay? The, the commonwealth is sick of their choice. Their over-greedy love hath surfeited. And habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. And habitation, giddy, what does that mean? If someone is giddy, without sorts, a little out of sorts, but it's not a negative out of sorts. It's yeah, they're full of themselves. 
Okay? They just think nothing can stop me. And unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. What's the vulgar heart? Common sentiment. Keep going. Um, what? The widely held opinion of the people. Exactly. The praise, the love of the people. Oh, thou fond many. Fond there means foolish. Many is the populace. Oh, thou foolish people, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke. Okay, now I, here I am going to make a political comment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be along the lines of the one my doctoral major professor made one day when we were talking about this uh, play in his office. When he was a, I think this was after he was teaching. He might have been a, a very late graduate student still. But he talked about how everybody, late 60s and early 70s, read Henry IV, the king, as kind of a, a cipher, a, a symbol of Richard Nixon. Okay? Nixon won in 68, fairly close. 72, blew um, McGovern out of the water. I mean, he was the biggest blowout, you know, 49 states to one. Okay? McGovern won his home state. That was it. Okay? So what does that mean? Nixon had the loud applause. He beat heaven with blessing. Everybody was in support of Nixon. Sound like anything similar recently? I mean, think of 2008. Okay, and I'm not saying President Obama is Bolingbroke, but the adulation that he received in 2008. I mean, think of his, um, my mind is dead, his Democratic Convention acceptance speech. Mile High Field in Denver, 78,000 people cheering, you know, the whole Greek columns behind and everything. It's the apotheosis. Well, that was after he's elected, okay? Before he was sworn in, though. After elected, before sworn in, a Nobel Peace Prize. Hasn't been a lot of peace, but you know, we'll talk about that later. All I'm getting at is the public adulation, okay, is what the Archbishop is talking about. Before he was what thou wouldst have him be. In other words, the people were in love with him, what? Before he ruled. But now that he's ruled, the Archbishop is suggesting, people aren't in love as much with him. Same thing happened to Nixon. Same thing has happened to President Obama. I mean, is he going to have the kind of election that he had in 2008? No. Is it going to be close? Some people say yes. Some people say no, that it's not 2008 again. It's 1980 again. Okay, and if you compare the coming election with 1980, there are some eerie parallels. Okay? Um, at this point in 1980, Jimmy Carter was about 10 points ahead of Ronald Reagan. By the time the election came, Reagan won by nine, nine points. Okay? So, in being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou, beastly feeder, art so full of him that thou provokes thyself to cast him up. In other words, he's saying the people are tired of Henry IV. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard. What is he really saying? And possibly Shakespeare threw him. 
What is the archbishop saying about the people? The common citizenry. Say that again. Easily swayed. Easily swayed? What else? What's a, a more negative way of saying that? They're fickle. <laughs> they are fickle. They ride upon the winds of rumor. It's not an accident that the play opens with rumor. Okay? Bolingbroke comes back at the end of Richard II, and rumor just flies in front of him. He comes like a god. You know, I mentioned the, the Greek columns behind Obama in 2008 for a reason. There, there was an implication there like we were back in Greek majesty. Okay? Mm, reality is maybe not so much. Okay? So, the common dog does what? It disgorges thy glutton bosom. And then what does the dog usually do? Old Testament proverb. It returns to its vomit. Okay? And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up and house to find it. Now, he's saying, the people are saying, if only we could have Richard back. Okay? A couple of years ago, started to see billboards at various points across the the country, because I would see blog posts about them. Pictures of George Bush. Miss me yet? Um, okay. Uh, what trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die are now become enamored on his grave. Thou that threw dust upon his goodly head, when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, Christ now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this. In other words, the English people are tired of kind of this, this undulation in politics. They want to go back to the good old days. Well, when what, what were the good old days? Merely Richard II? No, probably back even before then. Oh, thoughts of men are cursed. Past and to come seems best. Why is the past and the future best? They're both different from the present. They're, they are different from the past present. Because the past will always be a reminiscent thing. In hindsight, it's 2020. Okay. And the future can always look brighter than it really is. The grass is always greener on the other side. They're both unreal. The past is unreal. It's not real for us. Why? Simply because it is not present. You never have to worry about the past. How many of you go to sleep at night worrying about World War II you know, or the Vietnam War? Unless you're a Vietnam War vet, you don't. It's done. It's over. Okay? The future, it's not real. People who worry about the future worry literally about nothing. The future cannot hurt you, because what can only hurt you? Now. It's only the now that can cause real problems. Okay? So we leave that scene, and we get into this long scene with Falstaff and Mistress Quickly and the Chief Justice. Okay? <laughs> which I'm largely going to skip. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to skip that. And go to 2-2. Two, two. We have Hal, or the Prince Hal, and Pwans come in. 
And just as in Henry IV Part One, we have Hal and Pons plan to play a joke, essentially, on Falstaff. Okay? Now keep in mind, what's going on with the king at this point? He's getting sicker and sicker. He's dividing his forces. He's planning war. And, and Hal is screwing around. Okay. Um, oh, let's see here. I don't, in fact, I, I want to skip that scene and go on to 2 3. And we see Lady Percy beg with her father in law, Hotspur's father, not to go off to war. Okay. She says um, about her husband, top of 843, right-hand column. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. What does that mean? Yeah. He was the glass wherein they did dress themselves. He was the mirror for young up-and-coming knights. Guys who really wanted to prove themselves mimicked Hotspur. He had no legs that practiced not his gait, and speaking thick which nature made his blemish. And your gloss there I think is kind of odd, because it says thick, impulsively, impetuously. I don't think that's what it means. I think it means speaking thick with a northern brogue that is kind of hard to understand if you're from southern England which nature made his blemish. That is, that's the one fault. Became the accents of the valiant. It's like people would affect a northern accent to mimic Hotspur. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass, the copy and book that fashioned others. What's being shown us here? Not how. You would expect the young knights would emulate the future king. But what's the future king do? Okay, yes, he did kill Hotspur. Did he get credit for it? Which makes it even more humorous. What does that do to Hotspur's death? It lessens it. That Hal allows to be given out. Who was Hotspur's demise? Falstaff. Old, fat John Falstaff. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like, you know, um, General Petraeus being killed by some homeless person under a, you know, bridge. <coughs> it, it, it's not right. It doesn't work. Okay. Oh, miracle of men. Of men. Him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you. Okay, what that means is you left him in charge, second to none. No one was in order or in authority over him. Unseconded by you, however, has a negative connotation. What does it mean to be someone's second? To have their back. To have their back. He wasn't seconded by you. You didn't have his back. Or to use the military language, you didn't cover his six. You left him unprotected. To look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage. To abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. 
now. I haven't seen all of um, Henry the Fourth Part Two because um, I've kind of skipped back and forth. So I don't know how the woman who portrays uh, Lady Percy does this, but she could really do this in a scathing tone. If you had seconded him, my husband would still be alive. Okay? So you left him. Never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, they might. Today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. By saying that, she is suggesting you're not the only one to blame, though. Mowbray's to blame. The Archbishop is to blame. Okay? Is she using accusatory language to her father-in-law? Yes. But she's doing it to beg him not to get involved. Do not march in this war. Okay? Be shrew your heart. Be shrew means don't be a shrew. Like taming of the shrew. A loud, nagging, haranguing woman. Don't. <laughs> Fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting blah 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 blah. So she says, excuse me, Lady Northumberland says, fly to Scotland. Leave here, go to Scotland. Make it out that you are involved in a battle in Scotland. Northumberland borders Scotland. So it would make sense if he did go to Scotland that he is having to put down a Scottish raid. Okay? Could easily be accounted for. If they get around, Lady Percy says, if they get ground and vantage of the king... If the rebels get the upper hand and it looks like they're going to win, then march south. What? When victory is sure. Compare this speech back with what we looked at in uh, Act 1, Scene 3. Okay. When Hastings is urging everybody on and Bardolph's like, um, let's make sure Northumberland's going to come first. And here you have people now counseling Northumberland, don't go until the others attack first and appear to have the upper hand. Then you march in, and guess what? You'll get the credit. Because he'll be in the American 1930s Western what? The cavalry riding over the hill. The guys in white hats who will put down, you know, the dirty engine, so to speak. So, we go from there to another comic scene. Right? With um, the drawer that is Francis, uh, doll, what's her name, Tear. Staff or something, okay. False staff, etc. Pawns and and um, Hal are going to be there, and we're going to skip almost all of this. Um, let's see here. <coughs> Yeah, we're going to skip all that and go to Act 3, Scene 1. Okay? King comes in in his nightgown. He gives some letters to his page, and the page leaves. So, we get, I think, if memory serves, this is the first soliloquy by King Henry in both plays, I don't believe we have a soliloquy by him 
in Henry the Fourth, Part One. Okay, why is that significant? What does the soliloquy always do? Reveals inward thoughts. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep, gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse. How have I frightened thee? That steep my senses, excuse me, how have I frighted thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? Why rather sleep liest thou in smoky cribs upon easy pallets stretching thee and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber? than in the perfumed chambers of the great under the canopies of costly state. Notice what he's juxtaposing. People sleeping where? Smoky cribs and uneasy pallets. He doesn't mean cribs like a baby's crib. He means a hastily made bed, like a crib of straw. In other words, men at night out in the open, under the stars, in the cold, as opposed to perfumed chambers in great castles, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody. Oh, thou dull god. Who is the god of sleep? Morpheus. Morpheus. Okay. Um... Why liest thou with the vile and loathsome beds, and leavest the kingly couch a watch case or a common larum bell? Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes? That's the guy up on the lookout, sitting, sitting or standing in the crow's nest. Okay? And rock his brains and cradle of the rude imperious surge, and in the visitation of the winds, who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafing clamor in the slippery clouds, though with the hurly death itself awakes. Canst thou, a partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king. The young boy sitting up in the crow's nest, buffeted by storm and wind, by the shaking of the crow's nest. That one can fall asleep, and yet I can't. Then happy low lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Did Henry the Fourth? Think it would be easy to be king? The line kind of implies that maybe he did. And yet now he realizes kingship ain't what it's cracked up to be. Okay? So we hear the others come in and they say good morrow and such. And this is where we're going to pick up. Can you lower those blinds the rest of the way? I think you have to... Yeah, that'll be good. Sounds that. Yeah, I've already done that. It's up all the way. No, that's if I click it, it'll mute.
And with what danger near the heart? It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My lord Northumberland will soon be called. Oh, oh God. That one might read the Book of Fate and see the revolution of the times make Mountains level and the continent, weary of solid firmness, melt itself into the sea. Our chances, mocks, and changes fill the cup of alteration with divers liquors. <laughs> oh. If this were sea, the happiest youth. Viewing his progress through what perils pass, what crosses to ensue. Oh, would shut the book and sit him down and die. It is not ten years gone since Richard of Northumberland, great friends, did feast together. Views by you, cousin Warwickus. I may remember when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, to speak these words, I'll prove the prophecy. Northumberland, thy ladder by the witch, my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. For then, God knows, I had no such intent. But time shall come, <laughs> thus did he follow it. But time will come, that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. So went on, foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amities. Such things become the hatch and brood of time. And by the necessary form of this King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. And that same word, even now, cries out on us. They say the Bishop of Northumberland are 50,000 strong. It cannot be, my lord. Rumoured a double like the voice and echo the numbers of the fear. Please it, your grace, to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. Your Majesty has been this fortnight ill. I take your counsel. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay, so what is King Henry telling us in that scene? Okay, what else? Richard did predict what was going to happen. Okay. Why is that significant? King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow. Okay. Basically, I can't trust that guy. Northumberland is not the kind of guy you want to put your trust in. Not exactly. Um, 849, the King's Long Speech. Um, pick up with where we just saw, line 57 or so. Tis not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, friends did feast together, and in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years 
since this Percy was the man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs, laid his love and life under my foot, yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard. In other words, Henry saying, I couldn't have come back without Northumberland's aid. But which of you was by? You, Neville, as I may remember, when Richard and his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy. Okay, Northumberland, thou ladder by the witch, my cousin, bowling broke, ascends my throne. God knows I had no such intent. Richard, in that play, was saying, this is what will happen. Henry is telling us, at the time, he did not mean for that to happen. That was not his goal. We can believe him or not. My former professor said, like Nixon, you can't believe him. Okay. Um, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. What does Henry mean by that? He's saying that uh, he had to become king regardless of whatever. He had no choice in the matter. In order to preserve England, he said, I had to ascend the throne. The time shall come, thus did he follow it, Richard. The time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. What foul sin is the that referring to something else, or is it just saying, that foul sin. Or is it saying that foul sin? And there is something else meant by sin. Regicide. Is regicide a foul sin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was up until Parliament. Okay. Legally executed the king. It is for Catholics. Is Shakespeare writing this during the Catholic period? No. It's Elizabeth's reign. It's after the Spanish Armada. Catholics are held in low regard. Okay. So time went on for telling the same time's condition and the division of our army, etc. So Warwick tries to calm him. It's okay. Don't worry. We'll take care of Northumberland. Now, we're going to skip a bunch. You have another quote-unquote humorous scene with Falstaff and Shallow, who's a justice of the peace. Um, and others. And I want to go on to uh, Act 4, Scene 1. Okay. And we're going to see... Prince John, and how he deals with Mowbray, the Archbishop, and, um, well, actually, I want to read a little bit first. The Archbishop and um, Hastings, okay? Um, we see Westmoreland enter on page 854, and he addresses primarily the Archbishop, because without the Archbishop, the rebellion would die. Because what does the archbishop lend to their cause? Moral authority? God? <laughs> okay. So that's why Westmoreland says, line 41 and following, You, Lord Archbishop, who see, that is, Episcopal throne, is by a civil peace maintained, Whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched, whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored. That is, you rose to you know to your position during the periods of peace, whose white investments, meaning his vestments, his clerical clothes, figure innocence. You should be pure as snow. 
the dove and very blessed spirit of peace. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends upon Christ in the form of a dove when Christ is baptized. That's the image there. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war? Churchmen are not supposed to be soldiers. Period. Okay? Turn in your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine. Your tongue which ought to issue divine speech to a loud trumpet and a point of war. Okay? So the archbishop replies, and I'm going to skip the beginning part, and he says, picking up with 67, hear me more plainly. I have an equal balance. Justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer. He says, I've balanced. What can happen with this rebellion versus what is happening now? And find our griefs heavier than our offenses. The wrongs we suffer are worse than the wrongs that we will cause. We see which way the stream of time doth run and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion. Henry IV said, Necessity compelled him in greatness to meet. The archbishop is saying, The occasion, the times, forced them to do what they are doing. And have the summary of all our griefs. When time shall serve to show in articles which long ere this we offered to the king. He says, we've tried to talk to the king. Okay. Westmoreland. Whenever yet was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to great on you that you should seal this lawless bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine? He's essentially saying, how dare you use your, arch, your office of archbishop to kind of coat over this rebellion? When did the king deny, ye, deny you an appeal? He's saying, when did you hand you these letters to the king? It hasn't happened, okay? So, we pick up with Duke of Lancaster, what doth concern your coming, you, Lord Archbishop? Wherefore do you so ill translate ourselves out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war? I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer, and find our griefs outweigh our offenses, which long ere this we offered to the king. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person. Whenever yet were your appeals denied. My brother, General of the Commonwealth, I make my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part, and to us all that feel the bruises of the days before? You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. Here come I from our princely general to say that his grace will give you audience, and wherein that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Hath the Prince John a full commission to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? I amuse you make so slight a question. There is a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. The Prince is here at hand. Pleaseth your Lordship to meet his grace. In God's name then, set forward. <laughs>
my Lord of York. It better showed with you when that your flock encircled you to hear your exposition on the holy text than now to see you here an iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum. I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our griefs, which have been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this hydra son of war is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed to sleep with grant of our just and right desires, and true obedience of this madness cured, stoop tamely to the foot of majesty. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, there shall second them. You're too shallow, Hastings. Much too shallow to sound the bottom of the after times. This is not right to answer them directly how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all and do allow them well. And swear here by the honour of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties, as we will ours. And here between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it to you. You will maintain my word. And thereupon I drink unto the organs. Go, Colville, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay in part. I know it will well please them. Hardy, Colville. To you, my noble lord of Westmore. I pledge your grace. And if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. You wish me health in very happy season, for I'm on the sudden something ill. <laughs> Word of peace is rendered, hark how they shout. This had been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest. For then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party lose me. Go, my lord, and let her army be discharged too. And good, my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us, that we may peruse the men we should have coped with all. <clears throat> Go, good Lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders having charge from you to stand will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. Lord, our armies are dispersed already. Like youthful steers on yoke, they take their courses east, west, north, south. Like a school for Oak Cup, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my Lord of Hastings, for the which I do arrest the traitor of high treason. <laughs> and you will have this abuse, Lord Moshe, who comes on treason and attacks your birth. Is this proceeding just and honorable? Is your assembly, sir? So? Would you thus break your faith? I taunt thee none. Okay, <clears throat> go from there. Now, <clears throat> notice how Prince John acts. How do you respond to that scene? Hell of an actor. Hell of an actor, okay. What, I mean, what does he do? I mean, leave the three lords out. What happens to their army? They're slaughtered from behind. 
Okay, the rebel army disperses. They, these guys are all going home. And the prince's army rides up and cuts them down. Okay. Now we're going to see the three traitors at the beginning of, well, if it's in there, at the beginning of Henry V. Okay, we're going to see uh, King Henry V offer them a, essentially an opportunity to prove their new faith. Well, kind of, but not so much. Why does Prince John do this? I mean, listen to what he said. He said, I pawned you no faith. What does that mean? Didn't he swear that they would take their grievances and redress them? He is dressing them or redressing them. He's not paying any attention to them. That is a form of redress. Redress doesn't mean, oh, you get everything you want. Redress just means, yeah, I'll listen to them and then, you know, throw them away, okay? Notice how he acts. This is cold, cool, political, uh, what is called in international relations, real politic. Sometimes spelled with a K. It says, you know, you, you don't let touchy-feely things like mercy and compassion. Okay. Realpolitik, as an example, you know, in the, uh, the first Gulf War, would have been if George H.W. Bush had not listened to General Colin Powell and Dick Cheney. Colin Powell was the National Security Advisor. Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense who counseled him, stop the war. Had the Iraqis on the run back to Baghdad, the military was like, let us go. <laughs> we'll take care of them. You'll never have to worry about them again. Okay? But because the scenes of carnage were so great on the news, we're, yeah, no, we can, we'll stop, etc. An act of rail politic would have been annihilation. Okay. Now, go from there to Act 4, Scene 4, <laughs> and why what does this good news make me see? Oh, I should rejoice now, I'm just happy and good. And now my sight fails. Oh, my brain. Comfort, Your Majesty. Oh, my royal father. Suffering, cheer up yourself. Look up. Be patient, princess. You do know these fits are with this highness very ordinary. Stand from him. Give him air. He'll straight be well. Oh. No, he cannot long hold out these pangs. This apoplexy will certainly be his end. Speak, Lord, princess. <sighs> the king recovers. <sighs> into some other chamber. Oh, well, this is all flip, right? Speak low. The king will 
Your father is disposed to sleep. Will it please your grace to go along with us? No. <laughs> I will sit and watch here by the king. Notice how little Hal has been in this play. I mean, even in the text of the play, he's not in it nearly as much as he is part one. Why does the crown lie there upon his pillow? Being so troublesome a bedfellow. Her Majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in the heat of day that scolds with safety. Gracious Lord, my Father, by his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. This sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. I do from me his tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness. Shall, O dear Father, pay thee plenteously. My dear from thee is this imperial crown. Which God shall guard put the world's whole strength into one giant arm and shall not force this lineal honor from me. That, by the way, is shot at Gloucester Cathedral, because I recognize it. My brother here, my liege. Prince of Wales, he's not here. He undertook to sit and watch by you. Where is the crown? <laughs> Who took it from my pillow?
Oops. <laughs> I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was Father Harry to that sort. I stay too long by thee. I weary thee. What? Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt need invest thee with mine honours before thy hour be right? Oh, foolish youth! Thou seeks the honours that will overwhelm thee. Couldst thou not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone. Dig my grave thyself. Bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned. Not that I am dead. I'll pluck down my officers. Break my decrees. For now the time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is proud. Up vanity, dark royal state. All you sage counselors, hence! And to the English court assemble now for every reason, aches of idleness. Now may the confines purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that would swear, drink, dance, revel the night, murder, and commit the oldest sins the newest kinds of ways? Be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall give him office, honour, might for the fifth Harry from curved license. Pluck the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his teeth on every innocent. Oh, my poor king, sick with sore blows. When that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, 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 oh. Thou wilt become a wilderness again. Peopled with rules, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege. Wherefore did you take away the ground? God witness with me. When I found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. I spake unto this crown, as having sense, and thus upbraided it. The care on thee depending, hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou best of gold, art worst of gold. Other, less fine in carrot, is more precious, but thou, most fine, most honoured, most renowned, hast eat thy bearer up. Thus my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it, as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father. about pleading so wisely <laughs> in excuse of it. <sighs> Come hither, Harry, sit thou down by my side. And here, I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what thy paths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. For all my reign have been but as a scene acting that argument. But now my death changes the mood, for what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer soul. Yet though thou stand'st more sure than I could do, thou art not firm enough, since griefs are green, and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly taken out by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I will my lodge of fear to be again displaced. Therefore, my Harry, be 
paid thy cross to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels that actions hence borne out may waste the memory of the former times. Health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. Oh, thou bringst me happiness and peace, John. More would I. But my lungs are wasted so. Strength of speech is utterly denied me. How oh, I came by this crown, oh God forgive. Oh God, it may with thee in true peace live. Dominus quiquid pervisum auditum. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, I want to pick up, actually, I know, I know we still have a couple more minutes, but I want to pick up, actually, on whatever day it is, Tuesday, <clears throat> with looking a little bit more, a little more closely at the speeches by the king on 863, uh, the king in the hell, on 863 and 64, and then we'll go on to Act 5, Scene 1. I do want to show one more scene um, from this play before we go into Henry V, and it's the scene where Hal banishes Falstaff. If you haven't watched it, at least watch that. It's about the last five minutes of this production. All right, have a good weekend.